Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and the community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. My name's Nell Thompson and I'm the Secretary of the Australian Institute of Animal Management and I'll be hosting the webinar for you today. I've been on the AIM committee since 2013 and I'm also the coordinator of the National Getting to Zero program. The Australian Institute of Animal Management, or as we like to call it, AIM, is the national peak body representing local government animal management officers. The AIM committee consists of a wide range of professionals engaged in the various aspects of animal management. AIM seeks to support those engaged in the business of animal management and the function itself by providing training and information opportunities for networking and collaboration, and by encouraging the use of best practice policy and practices. AIM understands the significant pressures placed on local government and not-for-profit rescue and rehoming service providers when working in the companion animal management space. We welcome new members and people can join via our website at aim.org.au. So to the agenda for today. Once I hand over to our presenter, there will be around 45 minutes of presentation and around 15 minutes of question time once the presentation has concluded. The recording of this webinar will be accessible via our website to all members to watch at any time. We're going to ask that everyone mutes themselves during the presentation unless our presenter indicates otherwise. But if you have questions, you can start putting them in the Q&A section and we'll get through as many as we can at the end of the session. If you have more questions or we don't get to yours during the question time, you can send a message to our Facebook page and we'll get to it that way. As always, please excuse any working from home background noises that may filter through. I think with so many of us in lockdown, we've probably got dogs under the desk, so I'm sure we'll hear from them at some stage. We are super excited to have Dr. Diana Raymond here with us today to talk about the hot topic of behaviour assessments. Diana holds a PhD in Applied Canine Behaviour and a Bachelor of Animal Science. Her primary research area was canine behaviour and assessments in applied settings like animal shelters and pounds and the welfare of companion animals within the shelter system. She's worked in a variety of academic and industry settings, including as a TAFE and university educator, as an applied scientist studying companion animal welfare and behaviour and working dog assessments, a dog trainer, a shelter nurse, and most recently leading the behaviour team at the Greyhound Adoption Program in Victoria. Diana is now working to integrate and improve animal welfare and animal management practices in Australia through a variety of roles, including as the shelter supervisor at Second Chance Animal Rescue. Diana also runs her own business, providing practical evidence-based training and consulting on companion animal behaviour, management and welfare to people and organisations in the animal management and welfare field. And we're very lucky to also have Diana on the board of AIM. So over to you, Diana. Thank you very much, Nell. Um, welcome everybody. Um, with today, I will apologise in advance um, if the videos are a little bit sketchy, um, the internet um, where I am at work um, can be a little bit um, up and down at times. Um, if that does prove to be the case today, what we'll do is pop those videos up um, alongside the, the webinar um, when it goes up online. So welcome to the, um, today's presentation. Um, the primary purpose of today's Prezo is really about um, getting you know, everybody, giving everybody a foundation understanding of behaviour assessments. Um, and by and large, what I'm really going to aim to do today is to try and get those solid basics across. The purpose of this presentation isn't to go into a whole lot of depth um, about the different components of assessments, um, because it's a much bigger topic than what we can cover in a short webinar. Um, however, more than happy to answer questions um, and we will see how we go. So, um, these two little guys, I'll give them a quick introduction. This is Rocky and Basil. Um, they're two little dogs who, um, you know, having the good foundations that we have um, in, in my current workplace, um, but really having good foundations in any workplace um, that has animals coming into the shelter system have really helped a lot. Um, and you can see some before and after pictures there um, to give you a bit of an idea about the improvements that can be made if you have a good system. 
So um, the first thing to really consider when we're um, looking at animal assessment um, and kind of behaviour recording systems in any um, pound or shelter environment is really to think about why it is that we're doing what we're doing. Um, and so what are the things that we're actually aiming to achieve by collecting behaviour information and assessing that and passing it on to whoever our partner organisations are. Um, and the first and foremost um, kind of reason why we do this is to make sure we're actually compliant with the law. So um, Victoria has um, probably a little bit more in depth, um, our code of practice is probably a little bit more in depth than some of the other states. Um, but if you go through um, the legislation that's actually covering off um, pound, shelter, any type of kennel environment that's part of um, our animal welfare and management system, there are key things that we should actually be looking at and making sure that we do record so that we can ensure that we're actually providing a certain level of care for these animals, which is an acceptable level. So if we have a look um, at just the, the kind of um, examples that I've got up on screen at the moment, um, essentially the kind of core patterns that we see are that we need to make sure we are recording enough information that we can notice any change in animals' behaviour, which might um, indicate a compromise in the animal's welfare. And so that includes understanding what the animal's normal behavioural patterns are, um, expecting animals on a regular basis and reporting sick animals um, or those with behaviour problems um, kind of up the chain to a manager or veterinarian who can hopefully help. Um, and also, um, and for me, this is the really important part of making sure that our, our systems are really good. Um, we really need to, when animals have done their mandatory time, we need to be able to pass on accurate information to whoever our partners are, um, or indeed if it's the public who are adopting our animals. And one of the key impacts that we can have here by providing good information is shortening the length of stay for those animals that we make available either to rescue or to adoption. Now, if you have a look at these two guys up on screen, just as, as short examples, um, Girl on the right hand side, her name is Lucy. Um, Lucy came through to us um, here at SCAR. So um, this is one of the kind of examples from here. Um, she was out in Shoster, Foster for a short period of time, but she proved to be you know, a pretty you know, easy going dog who was sociable with people and animals. Um, and so when we popped her up, we made sure we put down as much information as we can from the foster carer and those of us who had handled Lucy. Um, and she was actually up for less than 24 hours before she had to queue at a party to come and meet her. Um, if we have a look um, at the girl on the left, um, I've just pulled that um, off one of the pound groups um, that I'm on, on Facebook. Um, and this is a really common example of um, some of the things that we see that can make it tricky for rescue groups to pull animals and result in animals staying within the system for longer than they necessarily need to. So if you have a look at this girl, she's about the same size as Lucy, very similar kind of type of dog. She's already dissexed, she's already microchipped. She's obviously not a young pup, she's been somebody's pet. Um, and when I pulled this picture, she was originally posted up on the 15th of this month and she'd been shared several times. And I double checked last night at about midnight and she's still up there with nobody against her to actually pull her um, and no rescue group. So, you know, just based on what we can see, um, she's potentially, you know, a relatively easy dog for a rescue group to take on in place if they know something about her. It's very difficult when you're um, looking at information online um, to decide what type of foster care you can send an animal to or indeed whether or not your organisation or group can work with an animal if you don't have any information about the animal itself because you don't know how to place it. So... Um, if you think of those two kind of main um, purposes for collecting this information, one, to get a good read on who the animal is and, and what their kind of normal behaviour patterns in the kennel environment are, so we can see if anything's starting to go wrong, um, and also to provide some information to somebody who's potentially taking on an animal, you can see that those two things can work together and we can literally just work that into our normal systems for collecting information about an animal. Um, in Victoria, our mandatory hold is eight days. So by the time you know you get to the end of the eight days, you've usually had some animal care staff, a ranger or a member of the public who's brought the animal in, um, some type of vet assessment typically on that animal, um, and then interactions with hopefully if you've got volunteers on site, but interactions with daily interactions with people in the kennels, and all of those points provide us with an opportunity to collect some information about the dog. 
Um, and that information can be really, really helpful, even if it is only within the kennel environment for whoever is taking on that dog, it's really important to keep. So um, when we're thinking about how it is that we're going to keep these records, um, the two main things that you really need to consider are um, how much time your animal care staff actually have to take the information um, and also how, um, you know, how, what's their skill set like and what's their base knowledge of behaviour like. And so that will really um, indicate what type of system you should be using to collect that information. Um, so if you have a look on the screen at the moment, we've got some, um, a really great um, behaviour sheet that was actually created by um, a team at the University of Washington for one of the shelters overseas. Um, and if you have a look on that, it's a big kind of busy sheet, but once you get used to using it and you actually have looked at it enough times to become familiar, it's quite quick to fill out. Um, and it's got behave, you know, potential indicators of negative welfare and at the bottom some potential indicators of good welfare. Um, and there's some really good research behind what those are. Um, and the really good thing about that sheet is if you're filling it out regularly, so you can see each column is one day, there's two weeks worth of columns on there. It can give you a really good quick, um, you know, indication of whether or not you're seeing some behavioural slide and the animal is perhaps not coping very well in the shelter environment. Or if indeed you had a day where something happened and that animal for one reason or another was either coping better or worse, and that will give you some information about what you can do with that animal to make it life better while it's with you. Um, it also helps to be able to pass that information on to somebody else. So something simple like that, that you can literally just print and keep with an animal and your staff can literally just tick the boxes, um, can work very well. Um, it is, however, a bit limited in terms of the actual information that you can get. And we'll talk about um, why it's important to be touching on some key topics and that information a little bit further on in this presentation. Now, if you have a look on the right, um, that's the current sheet that we use here at SCAR. Um, so our animal care team have um, gone through quite a bit of training um, in animal handling and animal behaviour. Um, and so we've, we've kind of put in the groundwork, I suppose you could say, in order to um, get them up to speed on what it is that we're looking for in those open note fields. So we've got, you know, the date, you know, are they eating, are they drinking, are they doing all the things that they need to do to just indicate their basic welfare. Um, and then we've got that open notes field. Um, and everybody is expected to pop notes in those fields. Um, and essentially, we've also got a behaviour team, they can come along and they can actually have a look at that. And in, you know, make sure that everything is going okay. So we'll go through and we'll actually screen the notes that are there. And then if anything pops up and is flagged with us as potentially problematic, we can go back look that information all gets transferred onto the animal's file. And that gives us a little bit more um, specificity or a little bit more detail with the behaviour that we're collecting. And so, you know, like I said, one of those considerations you really need to think about when you're developing a system um, for your facility or your organisation is really what's going to be um, the most appropriate thing for your team um, and how can you address, you know, pick the most appropriate thing and how can you get that other information that you might need um, or address any potential drawbacks from the system that you've chosen. So, um, patterns versus outliers. Now this is um, you know, one of those things where we can collect information um, across a period of time, and that will hopefully give us um, a good idea of how that animal is behaving within a consistent environment of the kennels or when they're out on walks. Um, and then it's important for us to really have a look at that animal and think, if we see some behaviour that we're concerned about, um, is this, you know, consistent with the patterns of behaviour that we're seeing? And so, you know, a sister, uh, an example of that could be if we've got an animal who gets quite excited when we go and we get them out of a pen, um, and then one day they're quite worked up because they've had several dogs walk past the front of them, we go to get them out of their pen, and then they start chomping on the lead and climbing the lead. Now, Yes, that is a concerning behaviour and we need to look at why the animal is doing that, but it's consistent with what we're seeing from the dog. We're seeing an excited dog who's got a bunch of visual triggers going past him. And so, you know, a next step up in the progression of that behaviour would be, um, it's not uncommon for it to be, the dog chomping on the lead and getting excited and bouncing around. Now, when we've got outlier behaviour um, or we've got behaviour that we're seeing which doesn't seem to be consistent with, 
with what we know about the animal, we also need to investigate that and really work out whether there's a clear trigger and that behaviour is indicative of something that's problematic or whether we're actually seeing the outlier because of the context that we're seeing the dog in. Um, and if that's the case, we really need to get the animal out of this particular context. So if it's a kennel environment that's setting the dog off, we need to get it out of the kennel environment and actually assess whether or not that's a problem for us. Now, the two little guys on the screen um, left is Mr. Nelson, the dog formerly known as Prince. Um, now, when Prince came to us, um, he had a bit of a history of throat trauma. Um, and so being a feisty little Jack Russell, who's 11 years old, um, he had some, um, I suppose his responses to, to pressure on his neck weren't always to, you know, to choose deference or avoidance. Um, he had, however, not actually done any damage to somebody and he gave really, really great warning signals. So when we initially brought him in, we started doing some work with him, sent him out into a home um, and we had a look at his behaviour in the home and sure enough, we were seeing those same behaviour patterns in the home. So we popped in a, a behaviour plan and he is still who he is, but he's got much better coping mechanisms and he understands now that, you know, he's being managed in a way that he feels safe and doesn't feel the need to, to choose to use grumpy behaviour and lift his lips and growl at people. Um, the little girl on the right, her name is Lola. Um, now she was a bit of a tricky one for us because um, if you just looked at the feedback that we got in the foster home, um, some of her feedback read very much so the same as Nelson's feedback. Um, and so the kind of picture that we're getting from her is that, you know, here in the, in the kennels when she's being handled by people who um, are pretty dog savvy and have some good handling skills, she's doing quite well. Um, she went into the foster home um, and was showing some kind of, you know, grumpy behaviour, which um, the foster carers were interpreting as resource guarding. Um, and then we kind of went back and reviewed what we knew about her. And it turned out that she had come from an extremely different environment to um, the one that we'd fostered her out in. Um, but that in that environment, she was sociable with dogs. She was sociable with people. She had excellent off-lead um, obedience. And so, you know, she went to dog parks every day. She lived with young children. Um, and the picture that we got of her was a very different picture. And so based on all of that information and the fact that she wasn't showing us any behaviours that would really indicate an increased risk of an injurious bite, um, we looked for a foster to adopt home for her, which was much more similar to the home that she came from, made sure that we had a good conversation with the people and placed her into that home. And she has been going great guns for about 10 months ever since. And so these are those two situations where we really need to understand What's that dog's baseline pattern of behaviour and what are the things that are shifting it off that baseline pattern of behaviour before we can make a decision about where we put those dogs? Or if indeed we do put them out into society again. Now, um, a bit of a note on language use. Now, when we are taking um, behaviour information um, about our animals and recording it down, and also when we're communicating that information to other people, it's important for us to... Um, a, be okay with, with sometimes being a little bit wordy um, because if it helps us to increase accuracy um, about, you know, telling other people what's going on with the dog, um, then that's actually okay. That's a good thing. So we don't need to make it as short and sweet as possible. We can give them a bit more information. Um, anything that helps people to develop a good mental visual of what's actually going on with that dog helps. Um, so what we'd want to avoid... Um, as much as Chelsea, the yoga instructor, who's kind of vegan and loves whole foods, um, is a great first line for a um, adoption profile. So if we're popping that up on um, somewhere like Pet Rescue, that's a really good way to um, get somebody to have a bit of a read, potentially connect with Chelsea with her picture. Um, and then we actually go into detail and some more accurate language from that point. What we don't want to see is that being the only information that's passed on about Chelsea, um, because that really doesn't help us to understand who she is and what she needs from life to A, have good welfare, and B, be a good pet. Um, we also need to be a little bit conscious um, of the descriptive language that we're using. So our one aunt man who's applauding the kindness of strangers, <laughs> um, going back to that idea of having a mental visual of what's going on, that's a really good example of us not actually being able to work out exactly how that man is applauding because he's only got one hand. And so if you are using descriptive language um, and so things like the dog chose to use aggression, um, make sure that you're clarifying that with enough detail 
that whoever the reader is can get that good mental image of what's actually going on. Because my interpretation of a dog who's using aggression might be very different to somebody else's interpretation. And that could be something as simple as a dog who very slowly over a period of time gives appropriate social signals that might include growling or giving a bit of a hard look because that is a dog who's choosing to use aggression to get their, their point across and communicate all the way through to a dog who escalates very quickly to level four or level five bites where they're biting down and doing significant tissue damage. And the outcome for those dogs, if we don't clarify our, our usage of the word aggression, could be very inappropriate for what we're actually seeing from that behavior. So we just need to be a bit careful about the language that we're using. And we really need to educate our animal care staff um, and the people who are doing handovers, if, if we've got partners, um, and making sure that the language they use is appropriate. So building on that idea of turning, giving people a mental image of, of what the animal is doing and, and what you know about the dog, um, our aim of the game really is to turn a rough sketch into a detailed picture. And we don't need people to spend half an hour every day taking complex behaviour notes um, about dogs that are in our care, um, because the good thing that comes out of research when we actually look at how predictive um, assessments in a kennel environment are, there's usually only a couple of things that come out as being predictive. One of those is that an animal that is relaxed and sociable with people and other dogs in a high stress environment like a kennel or during a vet visit is highly likely to be relaxed and sociable with people and animals in any other environment too. So it's not to say that the animal won't have some type of, you know, behaviour issue um, that might make them, you know, mean that we need to make some decisions about how they're managed to make sure everybody's happy. You know, they could be a really active dog that goes to a really inactive owner. But by and large, if they look sociable, and even when you're stressing, you know, you're stressing them out inadvertently, they're still sociable, that's a good sign. Um, we just need to make sure that where there are things that pop up that we think maybe this thing is of a concern, that we have good enough information in what we're doing to pass that information along accurately and make sure that from the perspective of us being transparent um, and us being accountable for the decisions that we've made, whether we place a dog, and also having the people that we transfer that dog to being accountable for the decisions that they make about the dog. The information that we put down on that piece of paper when we hand it over and get some signatures to say, yes, here is this animal, you're now taking responsibility for it, is very, very important and we need the detailed picture. So the different things that we really need to consider when we're taking this information, the first thing is, what did you see? Um, and that, you know, we can, hopefully people have, have watched the, the first webinar that I did back at the start of the year and gotten some of the basics down about, you know, looking at a dog and actually being able to describe what it's physically doing. So is it body, is it body weight forward or back? Um, is its height increased or decreased? Um, if it's growling or barking, like if you look at Luna in the middle there, um, that's that brindle girl who's behind the wire fence. Um, we actually picked that up when I was at Gap, we picked Luna up from one of our um, pound partners um, and she had been available for adoption, but she was showing some quite um, notable fear aggression towards people. Um, and so I went to meet Luna and I brought her back um, because the, the, the behavior that I was seeing that was described as fear aggression towards people to me was very defensive when I actually went to see it. And so if you have a look at that picture of Luna there, even though she's barking at us through the fence, I had a stranger with me at the time that she didn't know. She was one of our animal care staff, who she subsequently made very good friends with in a short period of time. But she's kind of barking, she's down, she's leaning back. All of her teeth are completely covered by her lips. Um, and she's kind of there, she's close to us to indicate that she wants to be with us. But all of the signals that she's giving us at that time, even though she was barking and she sounded a bit scary, indicated to us that she was actually worried and she wasn't intent on doing us any harm. And so when we're talking, um, when we're trying to get people to give us information about what they see, what we need is information about what the animal's posture was, did it move towards or away from whatever, whoever or whatever it was that they were engaging with? What was their body tension like? How fast were they moving? Was their focus very directed? And was it difficult to break their focus? Um, or they're pretty relaxed and they're kind of just looking at everything that was going on about and taking in information from the environment. 
Um, and the better that people get at doing that and recording what they see accurately, um, the, the more you can shift towards using that second category of um, kind of recording of information where people can give you good detailed notes and that both lets you, you know, see those patterns and make sure that you're compliant and you're taking all the information you need to see changes in behaviour, but it also gives you the accuracy to be able to go back and look at it and say, actually, I think this is what this is telling us about this dog and where they would be best as a pet. So, um, if, hopefully this video works okay. Um, when you um, watch this video, I want you to be really paying attention and trying to think about um, what it is um, that you can see um, and what it is that you can hear and what's one pot potential trigger for the behavior that we're seeing. So if you can have a bit of a watch and then pop in the chat what you think one of the triggers for this behavior is and hopefully it's clear, um, we'll see how we go. So I'm going to pop into the chat and see. Now, that boy's name's Coyote. He was circling because he found um, the kennel environment quite stressful for him. He was a very active dog. Um, and he was a dog who had a little bit of trouble relaxing in certain environments. And as I got stuck with cool, I will replay this. Yep, Charlene, he definitely does curve away from the door. Um, and so you can see he's obviously circling and as he gets towards that dog that's quite close to him in that top left-hand corner, as Charlene's noted, he basically looks away and curves away. Um, there's two things that pop up in that video. One, when you hear the change in noise, in background noise, when that second high pressure cleaner kicks in, if you're watching really carefully, you'll see that Cody actually starts stepping much quicker. Well, notably quicker. And so his circles and his footfall actually becomes quicker and his energy level goes up. Um, and that type of information can be really useful for us when we're watching um, a dog or we're trying to work out what it is about the environment that stresses him out. If that extra noise for him increases his level of stress and actually gets him circling quicker and drives his arousal level up, then we know that noise is a potential problem for a coyote. Um, there was also a, a point where, you, where we, he stopped and he actually looked out the very similar position to what he's in um, in the still of the video right now. He stopped and he looked out the front and he was almost a little bit frantic in the way he was watching as that animal walked past. The second big trigger for coyote in this environment was having unknown animals walking past his pen. Um, and so for him, something as simple as removing him from where he was, which is actually right on the corner of two walkways, and popping him in the far back corner of the of the kennel block, so he was far away from as far away from the noise as we could get him, and he was as far away from dogs who were coming past him as we can get him, made a big difference for him, and he was actually able to rest. Um, and so, when we're talking about protecting an animal's welfare in a kennel environment, what we need is kennel staff who can say to us, "This dog is circling. He seems to be circling more or faster when." you know, certain things are going on in the environment and maybe tell us a bit about what's going on in the environment. Um, and then we need to be able to go down and actually have a look and see what's going on for ourselves um, if you're the person who's hopefully going to remedy that. So second thing to be getting notes on is what you heard um, or what the person heard. Now, um, as a rule of thumb, um, when you're um, assessing noises coming from animals, and this goes across all mammals, um, is that short, sharp, staccato noises. So um, picture this in your brain of, of when you're interacting with a horse. If you want them to go faster, it's like click, 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 or you'll click them up. Short, high-pitched staccato noises like that 
increase the energy of the receiver. And so when animals are communicating, if you're getting really short, sharp, repetitious noises, that's an animal who's either trying to drive somebody away or trying to get them to come towards them. They're trying to get more activity happening in the environment. Um, low, long, lower pitched sounds bring energy down. So what we want to be thinking about when we're hearing dogs bark, dog barks a lot in the kennels. What type of bark are we hearing? Are we hearing a very high pitched panic bark? Ooh, that might tell us that that animal is having you know, a fear-based reaction or some type of panic reaction to what's going on around them. And then we need to look at what that thing is. Um, are they dog who's coming up to the front of the pen and they're wagging and their whole body is soft and they're bouncing around and they're like, woof, woof, woof to the other dogs who are coming past. In which case, that's probably a dog that needs to get out into a play group yard and get some jelly beans out. Um, we really need to think about dogs who are barking in our kennels. What is that barking telling us? Um, and also, what, what is the other noises that are going on in the environment? So like with Coyote's example, that change in pitch when the second um, high, pressure, um, high pressure cleaner kicked in, that was enough to trigger for him, even though the background noise was already quite loud and it was already the same type of thing. So if we have a look at this little video. <coughs> So you can see there's actually another dog in the soft crate. You probably can't see her extremely well. Her name is Maggie and that's Walt. He's one of my big guys. Um, and you can see there he's bowing at her at the same time as he's barking at her. And it's like a relatively um, low pitch bark. And it's bark, wait, bark, wait, bark, wait. And then he's like, bark, bark, bark. You got a bit frustrated and then he broke off. You know, that's a situation where he's like, do something wait for a response do something wait for a response and when you see that pattern of barking that's actually a good sign from a dog because what it's telling us is that the dog's communicating and then actually waiting for some type of social feedback back and so you know that's another one of those things that we can look for when we're actually getting um information about dogs who are barking are they actually just barking frantically and they're just never quiet down and they can't bring themselves down enough to get information from the environment? Or are they actually doing it to communicate and they're trying to get information back or trying to, to communicate with a, another person or animal in the environment? Cool. So next thing to consider is where, um, where the behaviour was observed. So where did you see it? Um, this is that same dog, the Rottweiler from the video clip that we just saw. Um, and Anybody who's watching right now who knows my dog knows that he is extremely variable in how he behaves depending on the environment that he's in. So when he is inside, so this picture over here on the left, um, when I was teaching at TAFE, he actually came in a lot and was um, a great helper dog for our um, vet nursing and animal study students. We could lay him down, they could practice Robert Jones bandages on him and raise veins and do all sorts of stuff. He, I don't know how many grooming sessions he went to. Um, but by and large, he's a dog who in that environment absolutely shines. Um, he's relaxed. He's not, you know, everybody who meets him is like, oh, he's a great dog. He's so fantastic. Um, next picture along, um, we're doing some scent work with him in a scent, you know, at a training session. Um, but there's a bunch of other animals in the environment. Um, and he was excitable, but he still very much so could work. And he worked quite hard and he worked for several hours. Um, the same dog at home. If we've got like the little motorbike that you can see, um, I live on a six acre bush block, we have kangaroos. Um, he gets so worked up because he's a very, very predatory dog that in the presence of anything that he's triggering that predatory behavior, he gets really worked up and he can actually get, if you're not careful, a little bit hard to control. Um, and that can get as bad, it has gotten as bad with him as he actually broke my leg once because he went to chase kangaroo and it all went a bit sideways and I fell over and literally snapped my foot off the bottom of my leg because he was so excited and he was just, you know, 50 kilograms of very excited Rottweiler wanting to do what he wanted to do. Now, the leg incident and that incident with the, the Robert Jones's bandage, see, I've got no, no um, shoe on my foot in that picture. That's because I still had a cast on. And so with him, where you see his behaviour is extremely important to actually tell me what's actually going on with that dog. He can be inside my front door, he can be relaxed, he steps outside and there's kangaroos outside, 
He's only moved for one meter and he's a very excitable dog. Um, he also, depending on who he's interacting with, can be really lovely with other dogs or it can be not very lovely with other dogs. So when we're talking about behaviours, we need to understand what the context of the behaviour is in order to interpret what we're seeing. Now, what else is happening at the time? So hopefully this video works. If it doesn't, we'll pop it up. Um, what I want people to be looking for in this video, now I'm pre warn everybody, at the end of this video, the greyhound does try to attack the small dog. Um, but there are some key things that we actually see in the time before that attack happens that can give us a bit of an indication about why it is that he went from looking like he could potentially be a sociable dog to trying to kill a small dog just within the space of the kind of 30, 40 seconds of this video. So keep an eye out on what it is that the greyhound is focusing on and what it is that he's looking at um, and when it is that he chooses to make that decision to actually attack a small dog. So going back to the chat box, did anybody see where he was looking in one of the five or 10 seconds before he chose to, to lunge in and try and grab that small dog? So he's walking along, he's not doing very much. And then he was actually looking and checking something in particular before it is that he actually focused in and went and did what he did. So did anybody pick that up? Well, first, did the video work properly? Yep, excellent, it's good. Charlene, did you happen to notice um, what it was that he's looking at? We can go back and watch that part of the video again, let's see. Alrighty, we'll watch it from here again and I'll talk you through it. He was definitely building up. See that little check in there where he's actually looking at me? He looks at the dog. And then he looks back at the handlers and then he goes in for the grab. And so if you watch that video from the start, there's no time at all that he actually showed any type of pro-social behaviour towards a little dog. But what he did do was as he's walking along, he stopped and he looked back at us and he was like, are you guys watching me? Kept walking. Are you guys watching me? Kept walking. The point in time where we kind of went, oh, we don't think we're going to see anything very much here was the point in time that he went, oh yeah, now they're not paying attention. Um, and then he double checked it with a slightly longer look and then he kind of double checked it again. And then he's like, all right, I'm going for the, going for the grab. And so something as simple as where the dog is focused, what he's focused on and what he's not looking at and what else is happening in the environment. Are the people who are there with those dogs or who are handling the dogs actively managing that dog? We're very, very good at kennel environments at preventing bad things from happening. Just because we can prevent a bad thing from happening doesn't mean a member of the public can. Um, and so it's really important when we're taking information to be thinking about you know, what's the context, what it is that we're seeing, what's the behaviour that we're actually seeing and hearing, what's going on around us. Um, and when we do see something bad that's, that's happening, I mean, that dog, that dog's not a dog who should ever be put out into society and he wasn't. Um, but when we do see something else that's happening, what are the potential triggers for that? And how are we going to work that out based on what it is that we're seeing? Um, and you can see sometimes it can be quite subtle. Now, who was there? Um, this is something that I flag um, probably with animal management people much more often than I flag um, with people who are working exclusively in the shelter environment or people who are working exclusively as trainers. Um, and the reason for that is this. So if you've got a bonded person with the dog and by a bonded person, that can be anybody from somebody who has spent research shows about 20 minutes spending positive time interacting with that dog. And that can be something as simple as a volunteer or, or a staff member. 
he gives the dog some treats, takes him out for a walk, you know, does a tiny bit of training with him, you know, three, four minutes, um, gives them some food, pops them back in their kennel. If you do that every day, which is the bare minimum you should be doing for that dog, give it a couple of days, you're now that dog's bonded person in that environment. Now, the presence of a bonded person or, you know, complete unfamiliar people or people that the dog doesn't have a social bond with can affect and, uh, and can influence how likely they are to show aggression um, and what, that, what kind of form that aggression is likely to take. And the reason why this is so important for animal management people is because you're often interacting with dogs in an environment where sometimes they're completely unfamiliar, so owner is not around, you know, dog is running around an unfamiliar environment. Um, and in that environment, a dog is more likely to be scared um, and be worried about a, a situation, but they're less likely to choose to use offensive aggression because there's nobody else around. The moment you bring a bonded person or a bonded dog or another individual which that dog has a social bond with, the dog might be less uncomfortable, but they're more likely to choose to use aggression. And so um, the reason why I have a picture of that particular German Shepherd, her name is Destiny, she is not the dog in question that I'm talking about. Um, she's going great guns, she's in a home and she's a lovely dog. Um, but for me, this was very much so rammed home quite early in my career um, when we had a German Shepherd come through the facility that I was working at at the time um, from a welfare environment. And he was just one of those dogs that made your hair stand up on end. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I was kind of nursing at the time and I went in to, to vaccinate the dog and give him a quick check over her. Um, and it, it was just something about the way he was looking at me that made me think I'm not 100% safe around you. And so I got the person who was handling him to restrain him a little bit more. Everything was fine at the time. Um, the kennel staff who were working with the dog all got that same kind of not 100% sure that, <laughs> that I'm comfortable with this dog, but he seems to be holding it together and not doing anything. And then unfortunately, his owner actually, well, his owner coming to see him wasn't unfortunate. But the result of that day was unfortunate, where in the presence of his owner, the kennel staff member who had been dealing with that dog for the last three weeks um, and who had a bit of a bond with him out of all the, the kind of staff, he was probably the one who had the best bond out of him. When the owner was present, he was interacting with the dog the same way he always did, which was careful. It was, it was not inconsiderate handling. He actually was bitten on the face quite badly. He had to have some plastic surgery um, to fix some of the wounds that actually occurred. Now, the trigger for that change in that dog's behaviour, the dog was obviously scared anyway, but the trigger for the change in the behaviour was simply the owner being there. Um, and it's really important to remember that when you're going from a situation where you have, you know, one dog without its owner or a bonded person to a situation with a bonded person or one dog versus two dogs who are bonded together, you're much more likely to see the use of overt aggression um, and you're much less likely to see a dog who chooses to use avoidance compared to what his normal behaviour is. So um, bearing all of that in mind, when we're thinking about recording, um, and this is probably most important for um, those behaviours that we're either worried about or we're kind of thinking we need some more detail about this or we think it's important to pass on to, an, to a partner, you know, what did you see? Where did you see it? What are you hearing? All of those things. Um, the way that we create consistency between staff members, because this is really one of those things that tends to um, be really, really hard to achieve in any environment where multiple people are handling dogs. Um, and no facility has the same people handling dogs seven days a week, I hope, um, because that person needs days off. Um, and so when we're looking at trying to create consistency between staff about how they're recording information, um, what information they are recording, when it is that they're flagging things that might concern them. Um, what we need to do is really think about what's that baseline level of skill and knowledge up and staff and what systems we can put in place to help create consistency, but without, you know, um, ruining that, the, the kind of um, detail that we can get or indeed um, getting inaccurate information. So if you have a look at the table that's up on the screen at the moment, um, you know, this is really quite common um, in a, you know, a kind of formal behaviour assessment kind of situation where you've got something like safer or meet your match or um, match up two, where a dog will be given a score, a zero, a one, a two, a three, 
um, based on the behavior that they're showing during a particular interaction. And so um, if we look at you know, zero, they're saying there's no signs of, of kind of fear or, or problematic behavior. Um, and the description there says the foster is neutral, relaxed looking or ignoring the assessor or friendly sociable, decreasing distances and or greeting the assessor. Now, it's good in that, that that's picking up that we're not seeing any overt signs of fear or aggression, or, you know, of, of offensive aggression in that dog. But if you think back to that video um, of the greyhound with the little dog, and you think of what that greyhound was doing, and he was very neutral, he was completely ignoring the little dog, um, and he was decreasing distance towards the little dog, you can see how, um, you know, giving that dog a score of zero because he fits that category could actually lead us into some problematic territory right up until the point that he actually grabs a little dog. And so what's important for us to, to really concentrate on when we're using this, um, a situation like this, is that we're getting, okay, we might give a score, but then we've got some notes next to that score that literally tell us, was that dog seeking, you know, affiliative or sociable contact with the person or the dog or the environment or it scored a zero and actually it was just kind of there and it was a bit shut down and it really wasn't doing much at all those two dogs dog one we can probably if that dog continues to behave that way and that becomes a pattern that we see throughout our entire environment that dog's pretty pretty much going to be okay to go out back out into the community dog two we need to find out more information about that dog because not seeing behavior is not an indication that it's not there. It's just an indication that for one reason or another that behavior is suppressed. Um, and so creating consistency through using this type of tool is great, but be mindful that there are drawbacks and we need some something else within that system to make up for those drawbacks. So what's the something else in the system? <laughs> the something else is literally training. Um, now, these are um, some examples of free or low cost training and good quality training. Um, now, everybody who's here is a member of AIM. And so you guys all have access to Justice Clearinghouse um, and all of their um, kind of webinars and their trainings that are up online. Um, Trish and I did um, some webinars for them late last year, including one on canine communications in the field in the shelter, which is literally aimed at people who are working in, in our field. Um, and again, that, that is really about getting people's eye in on that observation and teaching them how to make good records on what they're saying about a dog. Um, ASPCA Pro um, has six webinars. It's actually free in a webinar series. So if you just Google ASPCA Pro Canine Communication Series, um, a bunch of information will come up on there, including some online stuff about defensive handling, reading dogs, taking good notes, taking good notes for the purposes of behaviour assessment. Um, I always encourage everybody um, to look at the Fear Free Shelters program. Um, the good thing about that is it's free for everybody who's part of a, a non-profit. Um, so all people need to do is jump on and say, what, you know, where you're working for, um, create your account, and you can actually go on and your staff members, your volunteers, your foster carers can all go on and actually do the Fear Free Shelters course, learn some stuff, and there is an assessment. Um, that's actually associated with that, so you can become fear free certified. Um, and that's obviously trying to touch on two things. One is creating a better, a better observer um, and helping the animal feel safe, but it also helps us to keep safe because if we're good at observing what's going on with that animal, we're more likely to give an appropriate reaction back to the animal that will bring their stress levels down or will flag to us when we're in a situation that is quite dangerous and we need to take you know, whatever action that it is that we need to take to handle that situation and de-escalate it as quickly as we can. Um, now on that topic um, of de-escalating and handling dogs um, when there's something tricky going on, um, Mike and Trish, so Trish McMillan, the same person I did that Justice Clearinghouse um, stuff with, they have a two-day workshop that they're actually, they're presenting online at the moment because of COVID um, and they're running one at Australian time um, specifically to help out um, for us down here in the Southern Hemisphere, and that's coming up at the end of this month. Um, and so uh, I think we've actually shared the link to that a couple of times on the AIM closed um, Facebook group, discussion group. Um, but again, if you Google it and have a look, um, really good continuing ed for your staff. Now, be aware that all of this information is great and it's really good to 
get people to think through exactly like the, the kind of what we're doing now in a webinar where you can see stuff and hear stuff and think about it. But observation and handling animals is still a practical skill. You still need to actually have somebody there to coach people through. It's just like learning how to ride a bike or learning how to play tennis when you've got somebody there with you and they're actually helping you through that process of saying, actually straighten up your shoulders, drop your body tension, turn side onto the dog and actually step people through. Nobody is self-aware until somebody points it out to you. I'm the queen of that. Um, stepping you through those practical skills, the practical training is still important. So this is great and it's very, very necessary. And I always encourage people to do as much of this as we can. Pizza party at lunchtime on a Friday is an excellent thing. The practical training is also really important as well. Now, assessing behavioural risks. So this is a topic that I could probably talk about for the next three days. Um, but the main, the main point I really want to get through to everybody is that when we're assessing risk, the more we know about behaviour, the better we are at observing. Um, and the more we know about what behaviours um, within the context that we're seeing the dog in. So within a kennel environment, there are some behaviours that we see but if we see them, regardless of the fact that the dog is in a kennel environment, we should be paying attention and we should be concerned. Um, and it's really, really important not to just say, oh, the dog's in a kennel environment, you know, they're stressed and just kind of blow through those flags or those potential things that we should be saying, this is a predictor of something could go very badly wrong um, just because the animal is in a kennel environment. That said, there are also behaviours that we see in a kennel environment that are a very predictable result of the kennel environment itself. They're not indicative of that dog being at an increased risk of, of you know, giving an injurious bite to a person or another dog. They're not indicative of, you know, that dog not being suitable for a pet. They're behaviours that we expect to see because the kennel environment creates them. Um, and some of those things, you know, barrier reactivity, um, some types of resource guarding, um, those things we can, when we see them, we need to flag them and we need to address them because oftentimes they indicate poor welfare for that animal or reduced welfare for that animal. But they're also behaviours that we need to understand could well be context specific. So if we see them, we need to say, all right, this is not necessarily an indication that this dog is a problematic dog outside of this environment, but we either need to, if we're going to send that dog to rescue, we need to flag the behaviour with the rescue or we need to say, we actually need to investigate this more before we let this dog leave our facility. When we're looking at behaviours like, you know, predatory behaviour, dog aggression, um, high level um, arousal and strong focus, um, you know, on prey animals or on other dogs or indeed on people, um, even in the context of a shelter environment, particularly if they're, they're um, combined with behaviours where animals are closing distance um, or, you know, they're muzzle punching <laughs> muzzle punching barriers and things like that you know that combination of behaviors is something that we need to be concerned about um now the trick for, for you guys everybody who is particularly if you're in a pound environment is to know enough to go okay this is something i need to worry about or this is not take really really good notes but also know enough to know when you need some help from somebody else when do you need to get in somebody who um has a good enough background in behaviour that they can look at it and say, yep, it's an issue. No, it's not an issue. Actually, you don't know right now. You need more information. How do we go about getting it? Now, the more resources you've got, the more in-depth you can go into that process. But don't let that stop you. Where you have a, a very valid concern based on good information, so based on good, clear observations and interpreting those observations in light of best practice and what we know about animals how animals behave in a shelter environment. Don't let that stop you from saying, actually, I'm really concerned about this animal and then restricting where that animal goes or in the event that there's, there's really serious concerns about how safe they are, how safe they are, stopping them from leaving. Um, that said, we tend to, as a whole field, we tend to slide towards not letting animal any animal go. And so this is where we need to really work that gray line of what works for your organisation how many resources do you got? How many, you know, how well are your staff trained? Um, what's your actual kennel environment like? Because that will really make a difference to the behaviours that you're seeing. If you've got play groups and you've got outdoor space and you, you know, have dogs who you can actually get them resting very well for a good 10, 12, 14 hours a day, 
those animals will show a very different set of baseline behaviours to dogs who are kept, you know, in a normal code of practice kennel. They go out for a couple of toilet walks a day and they're constantly having dogs walk past the front of them. What we expect to see in those two environments are different even though they're both kennels. So what we really need is for everybody to not go, here's a plan, I'm just going to overlay this onto my facility and let's just see if we can make it work. The reason why that doesn't work very often is because it's not tailored to what you're doing. It needs to be tailored. So um, the transparency and accountability bit, um, this is the part where I suppose um, oftentimes when I'm talking with people, it tends to be um, a topic that people either avoid entirely or they have quite strong feelings about. Um, and it's tricky. It's a really tricky situation because it doesn't matter. Sometimes it really doesn't matter what decision you make. There will always be some form of consequence for that decision. The best advice that I can give everybody is to create systems to keep detailed records um, and make sure your staff are trained to keep those detailed records and actually to handle dogs well so that, you know, you're doing the absolute best you can to care for the animals and to provide a high level of care for those animals while you've got them and take good records about the level of care and how that animal has behaved. Share that behaviour information. So if you've got rescue partners who want to, you know, who are w working with you or you're trying to get dogs out to rescue, don't be that rescue who has 15 dogs or that, that organisation who has 15 dogs up online and none of them have behaviour notes. Or next most common is, was picked up as a stray, the owner didn't come to pick it up. Cool, that's great. That tells me how the dog got into your facility. It doesn't tell me anything about who that dog is or how it's behaved. How did it behave when you picked it up? How did it travel? Is it cleaning its kennel? Does it walk nicely on the lead or does it pull? Is it excitable? Tell me about all these things that you see. Share that information. Um, you know, if a dog is showing some resource guarding behavior towards other dogs over their food bowl in the kennel, Share that information. It's important that we do that because that's how people can make good decisions about whether they can help the animal um, and what type of, you know, what type of management, what type of home that animal needs to go into before they're actually comfortable placing it. The next bit of information is to make sure that when you do transfers, um, don't just have a, you know, in Victoria 94Y or whatever um, agreement that you have in place with your rescue groups. Um, and just send dogs out with, you know, a couple of bits of, um, you know, a couple of bits of paper with their vet history and their dissection certificate or their, you know, their microchip number on it and a signature which says, yep, you've got this animal, this is the microchip number. You've seen behaviour from that animal that should be passed on. Whatever that behaviour is, make sure it's written down, make sure it's clear. And when you get them to sign that piece of paper to say, yes, I'm taking the animal, make sure they read that bit of information about the animal. Even if it's just you scanning the kennel sheet and saving that onto the animal's electronic file or pulling that piece of paper out of the animal's, you know, whatever the animal's paper file is, if you're still using paper files, pull it out, get the person to read it and get them to sign and date it to say that they have that information and that you've given it to them. If you are transparent and you are accountable in that you make sure that, you know, you have a system in place where you can flag animals who you genuinely feel are unsafe, and you've got information from somebody who knows a lot about you know, making these assessments and they have said, yes, that is a, a, a good accurate assessment, then don't make that animal available. That's your accountability bit. The transparency bit and getting other people to sign helps keep them accountable for what decisions they make with that animal. And so when we're really open and honest with each other about kind of behavior information that we get, which can sometimes be really tricky because those conversations can be hard, and when we're, we're accountable ourselves, we try our very best to be transparent and accountable with our partners. That's where we can actually make these systems work. And also be open to feedback from your partners. If you've seen particular behaviour, they take an animal out and they say, as soon as it got out of this environment, it was absolutely fine. 24 hours into the home, he had a big long sleep. Chilled out, he was fine. And that's not what you saw and you had big concerns about that animal. Maybe it's time to have a look at your, you know, your assessment process or, or you know, how it is that you're making decisions about those animals. That's the type of feedback that helps you make that tailored program for your particular facility or your organisation. So um, we will open up to questions. Hopefully it hasn't been over time. Um, now, should we do the chat? 
Yes, let's have a look. Now, where are we? Here we go. Q and A. All right, that was a huge amount of information. Um, Sorry, thank you, I'm Di. For not I think, <laughs> no, I think it was fantastic, and particularly um, having the videos really helps. Well, it really helps me to start with because you can, you know, as you're commentating on the video, you can actually you know, you can match up their behaviours that perhaps you didn't see before or earlier. Um, yep. So I really like ha having the videos in there. I think it's really helpful for people. Um, <laughs> Charlene, brilliant as usual, Di. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you, And, and Heather enjoyed it as well. That's fantastic. Oh, awesome. um, the best thing is that, um, do we have your contact details? We do Diana? on the next. Okay, let's flick that up now. We, um, we are getting to five past one, so people may need to run. Um, but please reach out to Diana um, if you have further queries or would like to discuss the practices that you have um, happening in your facility and for your organisation, um, because that's a really great way to... Um, to iron out issues is to have an external set of eyes going over things um, and helping you with that. It's very difficult to see things when you're in it. And I speak from experience here. So um, take advantage of those resources that are available, those ex external resources, um, you know, from skilled and educated and knowledgeable people. Um, but this is the second part of um, the webinar series that Diana has delivered for us and you can view the first one on the website. So go back and do that if you haven't seen it. It's a great one to have a look at uh, behaviour and body language, both your own and for dogs. So once you view that one, you know, this one can then slot in behind it um, and use them as, you know, staff training resources as well. It's great to have everyone on the same page. So um, if there aren't any further questions, thank you very much everybody for being here. Thank you very much, Diana, for taking out the time to run through that with us. I think that we, we're seeing things progress in this area um, dramatically and it's through people sharing their skills and information like you're doing, so thank you. Stay tuned to um, our social media pages and e-news for announcements about future webinars in the series. And feel free to send us through suggestions for topics or presenters that you would like to see featured. Um, everyone's saying thank you very much. I enjoyed it. So that's fantastic. That's why we do it. We appreciate that feedback. All right, everybody, take care, stay sane, and we will see you at the next one. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.